All right, this is Brent Leary, and with me today is Dennis Mortensen. Dennis is the CEO and founder of X.AI. Uh, Dennis, thank you for joining me today. Thanks so much for having me. I can't believe it's been closing in on three years since we first talked, uh, and, and I got the scoop on what you're doing with X.AI and the whole using virtual assistants for calendaring. Uh, but maybe just for the benefit of folks who may not have seen that or heard that, uh, you could give us a little personal background. Sure. So my name is Dennis. As you said, I've been working on this intelligent agent that can, that can schedule meetings so that if you shoot me an email and say, hey, Dennis, I'm going to be in Manhattan come the first week of September. Do you got time to meet up? I can simply reply back in my kind of email client and say, sure, I'm up for that. I have cc in Amy at X.AI. And she can help find some time on my calendar. Click send, immediately click archive, because this is not my job anymore. And then Amy will kind of, one, understand what I just asked her to do, remove me from the conversation, reach out to you, and have this kind of very natural back and forth on trying to figure out exactly when you're going to be in Manhattan, when we should meet up, where our office is at, and upon conclusion, send out an invite. And it's not that you haven't heard this before, right? I said, this is a job function where you can just hire a human to do it. It's just that humans are kind of expensive. So <laughs> most people don't have a human. What they do have is themselves. Or what they really have is yet another chore in their inbox. And we're simply just trying to kind of remove that chore. And, and it's one of those things that kind of sound easy when you jump into the pool. And then uh, I've been swimming in that pool for the last four years <laughs> trying to kind of solve this. So it's interesting. So when we first talked, you were about a year or so into it. Now you're four years and in, in so into it. Uh, what have been some of the biggest developments or changes in what Amy is able to do? You should a hundred things, right? This could turn into some sort of half-day seminar for where you ask me <laughs> one question. Four hours later, I kind of get to the end of it. But let me at least just... Uh, suggest two things and uh, we can go uh, as deep as you want. Okay. There's certainly this idea and I think perhaps self-driving cars would be a good analogy here for where you quickly see some progress as in, hey, here's a car, it's driving itself from point A to point B and that looks uh, like some version of the future, certainly a version of the future I want to live in and then when you reach that uh, point B, you figure out, now when I'm at 85% accuracy, and that kind of went rather rapid, the fight to get that remaining 15% is just a year-long endeavor. Mm. And fighting to go from 97 to 98 is almost the same amount of work as going from zero to 95. Wow. It is just so hard once you kind of get to the ceiling so we've been really working hard on accuracy, not just since that one year in, for where I would say most of the first year was simply just defining that universe that we exist in. And the last three years have been on trying to kind of perfect the agent, so the agent can truly kind of operate in a fully autonomous way. That is kind of one, and anybody doing anything with an agent which is supposed to be autonomous, whether it is driving a car, or schedule a meeting, or doing any number of things, I think will have that kind of interesting curve for where you are just uh, hyped on progress that first year, and then you get into that really slow progress for where most people just surrender. We stop to it though, as saying we will get to the very end of it. And Amy and Andrew, our two agents, are in extremely good shape. They've never been more accurate, never been faster, never had more skills than today. But taking that aside, I'll just pick one particular thing which wasn't as obvious to me the day we started. So certainly the day we started, or I think for any tech geek, uh, like you, know, you and me, there was something fun. I think that's a good word. Something fun about seeing people kind of being fooled by the fact that Amy was a machine, kind of running daily touring tests and uh, winning most of them. What we certainly found over the years is that there's very little to win 
in that Turing test. So when you do win, they actually don't know. So it's not like they are impressed. They just didn't know the meeting got scheduled, it's on their calendar, and that's that. But when you lose, you lose a lot. I think it's actually a poor intelligent agent design principle. Just like that self-driving car shouldn't have some sort of dummy in the driving seat to suggest that a human is driving it. That's just crazy talk, right? And that's very obvious that you wouldn't do that. It probably needs all sorts of other signals because now you can't look the driver in the eye and kind of kind of pick up whether he's going to move forward at pedestrian setting. So we suddenly learned the same that we try very hard to make sure that people understand from a design point of view that you are now talking to a machine. But we also try to do a job so well so that come the end of that conversation, you still kind of feel uh, okay in saying, ah, thank you very much, Amy. So there's been a lot of design exploration over the last three, four years. And I think we've become kind of experts in something for where I'm very kind of aware of the fact that we certainly don't have all the answers just yet, but we're certainly much more tuned into how to actually design these agents. And there'll be a whole industry uh, kind of blossom around this kind of set of design principles, just like you and me and everybody we know who's done anything in the software space for the last 20 years will have good ideas of design principles for the desktop or design principles for the mobile UI, but not many of us have really good design principles for the intelligent agent or fully invisible software. So those are kind of two, uh, two good notes from uh, the last three years, yeah? Yeah, it's funny that the uh, whole idea of design and designing for things like uh, these assistants and, and voice assistants as well, it seems like there's a lot more emphasis being put on that today than it was a couple of years ago when these technologies were starting to come up. And I do think, and perhaps this is too anal, but I do think it's kind of important to at least separate the UI from the agent or the intelligence, if you will. And there's certainly a true move towards the conversational UI. And the conversational UI can be realized in straight up voice, Alexa, Siri, Google Assistant, and so on and so forth. Or it could be realized in text form, like writing uh, Siri and uh, getting some sort of response on your phone or writing Amy and her kind of writing back to you about when we're supposed to meet. But that's a UI paradigm. And we moved from the command line interface where I took my CS degree to some sort of graphical use interface which my mom worked in for decades with spreadsheets and word processes and what have you to a mobile UI which my kids grew up on to this baby step into the conversational UI. I'm not sure we exactly know what that entails and how much of an overlap the conversational UI will have with any of the prior UI paradigms, but they're just UIs that are not intelligent in their own right. Now, the reason we haven't seen as much intelligence uh, you know, all of the progress in machine learning over the last kind of decade, surely, but also that some of that intelligence or some of that autonomy is kind of difficult to inject into any of the prior UI paradigms, but in the conversational UI, it sort of becomes much easier to design for autonomy, as in you asking me a question, hey Dennis, can you go find me a pair of tickets to Miami this weekend for my wife and two daughters and I need to be back Monday at 8 a.m.? That's a request which you and I get. It's a request for where you and me could jump into Expedia or Kayak and kind of solve for it. So it's a very good interface to kind of describe objectives for where the graphical interface is not as robust an interface for that. So now that this is arriving, then you're seeing these agents not just being kind of question answer machines, what's the time in Singapore, set my alarm for tomorrow morning, but real agents that will have some objective described and then needs to kind of have the capacity of the intelligence to kind of run off on their own. And I think the sooner we can truly separate the two, the better the principles we can come up with, both kind of design principles and kind of 
reasoning principles on the other side. I read uh, on your blog uh, when Google Duplex came out, kind of your response to it. Uh, were you surprised at the reaction that uh, that that kicked up? Not really. So we had that response years back, and plenty of people. And this is going to sound not true, but it is true. Plenty of people assumed that when we put the fact that Amy's an AI in her signature, that it was some sort of growth tactic or growth hack of some sort, a viral hook. I get it, Dennis, but that was actually not the point. The point was that almost immediately after us having launched the product, we saw most of the people coming back saying, I don't mind this being a machine. What I mind was in my try to reschedule I kind of applied a level of empathy for why I'm rescheduling. My daughter was sick and all sorts of reasons. And I feel a little bit duped now that it's a machine. You should just have told me. I don't mind, but don't pretend to be something that you're not. So we almost immediately started to disclose the fact that this is a machine. So that moment they had, I could have told them up front, you got to design for full disclosure. And you saw almost immediately thereafter that they came out and said, we will disclose that this is a machine up front. So that was uh, certainly no surprise. But I do think, without getting too anal here, that there was kind of two parts to their presentation. You saw some really fantastic technology on text-to-voice. This ability to take a text string and turn it into some believable voice. And having your Kindle read some text or having Siri read out some blog post, you know immediately that that's a machine. Might not matter. You might be okay with that uh, level of quality. But the level of quality that they were able to extract from their kind of text to voice technology was just staggering. I was truly impressed uh, as a technologist. But that is just the ability to create really samples and we shouldn't take away from that but that doesn't suggest a new level of intelligence or a new level of ability to reason in this scheduling universe it just means that you're really good at creating samples but most people read the kind of human ticks of mm, uh, as some sort of intelligence but that's <laughs> not what was going on here it was just really good tech on this end of it on the reasoning end, what you could see is that they really kind of confined the universe, which was one-on-one -on -one meetings where they kind of defined resource, amount of tables at some restaurant, which you can go kind of schedule for seven in a yes-no scenario. And they did well. And I operate in the exact same space, but have to kind of have a much more kind of wide space in the kind of business meeting for where you have multiple participants, some optional, some mandatory, somebody's an assistant, somebody's the meeting coordinator, might be at your place, might be at my place, we might have to extend it and so on and so forth. So certainly uh, impressed about the first part. I haven't seen how much reasoning they've baked into it outside of the ability to kind of schedule tables at restaurants or get a appointment set up with a hairdresser. You know, when we first talked, um, Alexa Echo devices were really new. Um, Google hadn't even come out with Google Home. Uh, Apple wasn't even a blip on the radar with, with what they're doing. Uh, but now, fast forward to today, what impact has uh, these voice assistants had on uh, kind of the direction you thought things were going? So if anything, I made some entrepreneurial bet on the fact that they would proliferate because there's many things you can do as a startup, but there's only one thing which you cannot do, which is educate the market. Mm. That is so expensive that if you're in a setting as a startup for where your success hinges on your ability to educate the market in full, then you're already lost. That is a big core task and you need to make sure that somehow that is being taken care of in most scenarios.
startups. Doesn't mean that you and me can't find examples of startups that's been able to do so, but I'm very skeptical of taking on such a challenge. So I certainly hoped that there will be one of those Amazon echoes on every Christmas tree for the last kind of three years, and it certainly looked like that was the case, and to the tune of tens of millions of uh, devices right now. And what that have done is introduce the conversational UI to normal people, that this is not something where you need to be a geek to fool around with Alexa. You can just be my mom and put one of these devices in your bedroom and you can ask it about the weather, or put it in the kitchen, have it just kind of set a timer, and it's normal. And the more normal that becomes, the less I have to kind of train people on how to use the conversational UI or how to use Amy and Andrew at X.AI. So do you see, uh, or, or maybe are you surprised that so far the integrations between the big platforms like Amazon and, and Microsoft and Google, they just haven't happened really. I know there's some announcements, but we haven't really seen anything. Uh, are you surprised by that? And do, and do we need that kind of level of integration to really move it even further in? I don't think we'll see any real integration. You're absolutely right that Amazon and Microsoft have kind of introduced some idea of getting access to Katana through Alexa, but certainly as I read it, it's mostly marketing, and I'm not necessarily seeing that being something that we should expect to kind of proliferate in the market. I think all of them are fighting to become that new platform or that new OS. Because I do think that you'll have some sort of enabler AI, if you will, where you become friends with Siri or Google Assistant or Alexa, and you expect them to kind of be able to answer a lot of questions, be able to do the most basic of things, just kind of like when you buy your iPhone, it comes with a set of basic apps, and you can kind of use it right out of the box. But if you really want to personalize it and use it as a work tool, you install 40 other apps on your phone that are unique to you. I said, what does a Danish American dude with two teenage daughters living in Manhattan running a startup need on his phone? I said, Apple will have no idea, which is why you got an app store with three million apps, and I'm going to install my own specific applications. I think it will be the same in this new setting where you'll become friends with, say, Alexa, and you'll kind of use her as the enable AI. So you'll manage the lights or your heating or any number of other things around the house, and you can ask her some basic things to do with productivity or what have you. But if you really want to kind of get work done, you would expect her to be able to integrate with a set of highly verticalized AIs that are super specific, can do one job or do that one job really, really well, and that's how it becomes specific. So I think it'll be a fight amongst the top five. They will never really cross over, and you'll kind of see people pick one of them, just like you might have an Android, I might have iOS, we might have pretty much the same kind of uh, opportunities, but it will be you picking one of those and then kind of installing that set of skills on top of it. So, so how does this impact what you do at X.AI in terms of do you try to develop for the five platforms? Do you pick one or two that you think are really going to stick out from an enterprise perspective? And do you think uh, integrating with an Alexa or a Google or a Siri, does that increase uh, the kind of rate of adoption that you would see in the enterprise for X.AI? So we happen to be operating on email, which is an open platform with no dependencies or ownership, given that most of your meeting requests arrive in your inbox. Okay. However, wherever you talk about meeting up with people, I want to be. I don't think that will be on any one of those platforms just yet, simply because they haven't arrived in the office just yet. We just launched Amy and Andrew on Slack, so instead of you kind of branching out and setting up a meeting by going to a calendar or asking Amy and Andrew to kind of set it up over email, you can simply just wake them up directly within Slack if you're speaking to 
instead of uh, product people in the product channel, you can just come and do slash Amy, set something up between Ilya, Diane, and I tomorrow afternoon for 15 minutes at the office, return, and then that's done. So wherever you talk about meeting up with people, that's where I want my agent to exist. As soon as you'll see the Alexa or the Google Assistant be in the corner of that meeting room in your office, then we also want to be on that platform. But I'm kind of not interested in making a bet on them. I'll just pick anything which arrives in the office and then just uh, attach myself to that. And so far, that have been email, Slack, and if you really ask me what we hear the most of those two channels is text messages. So that when you're on the go, you can simply just uh, either text Amy or Andrew or some of your kind of most intimate meetings, wife, daughters, college buddies, what have you, might just kind of happen over text or messaging. So if we were to look out uh, the next three to five years, where are we going to be? Where is Amy going to be and Andrew going to be? And in general, where are we going to be with virtual assistants? I certainly see a near-term future for where the idea of having an assistant is not exotic and becomes normal, perhaps so normal that if you go for a job interview and they ask you, so tell me about some of your skills. Typically that would start with you going to school up at Columbia, taking this particular degree, some level of work experience, and the usual type of commentary. But perhaps that will start to include, but I've also hired these six agents that I've been training over the last two years so that when I do do inserts to Salesforce or when I do kind of schedule my meetings or when I do do my reimbursements, these are the agents that I use. This is how I use them and this is why I'm slightly more productive than the next guy you're going to interview. So they might just end up being some sort of extension of you, so much so that if you go into a job interview and you don't bring any one of those agents, it could seem a little bit kind of eccentric. Kind of like if you go in for a job interview today and say, I don't really like using a laptop, so I'm just going to use the phone and uh, kind of mail people uh, letters over USPS. <laughs> what? Well, who is this guy? <laughs> That's not going to work. And I think this could end up being the same, where you must somehow just expect any individuals to come in being empowered by AI. One last thing I thought about, what role are millennials playing as they move into the work face at higher numbers uh, in adopting this kind of technology? I think they might just be less willing, which I like, to do little meaningless chores day in and day out, stuff you and I have just accepted. And I can just take my own tool as a good example, but there's plenty of this in your inbox for where I spent the last 20 years setting up meetings in exactly the same way. I said, when I got my first email, what was that, 90, 91, and I had my kind of first meeting, it was a different email client, but it was kind of the same way, right? My buddy emails me, I email back, do a little bit of ping pong, we agree on next Wednesday at 1, I assemble an invite, I send it out. It's the same ICS file, by the way, that goes out today than it can kind of compare to what we sent out 20 years ago. So for 20 years straight, not a weekend, not a couple of weeks, but for 20 bloody years, I did email ping pong. I said, that's a lifetime. I don't think the generation kind of behind me will be as willing to do a stint of 20 years of a shitty chore. <laughs> I think they were kind of asked to have that removed. I said, hey, you know what? I didn't go to school until I was 24 to sit here and do email ping pong. No, thank you. So I think they will just ask to kind of have these agents be part of their job. I said, surely it will seem almost pretentious if you came out today, perhaps, and said, hey, I'm uh, 24, I'm going to be a junior sales associate or a uh, junior marketing manager of some sort and I would like a, a personal assistant and you would just say what fuck her off you know get a little bit of experience and then perhaps uh, you not have to do some kind of uh, job you certainly don't get a personal assistant but perhaps it's a fair request and they should get one not at $60,000 a year but perhaps uh, at $17 a month 
Wow. All right, Dennis, it's been great talking with you. Where can people go to learn more about what you're up to? What they should immediately do is close down this uh, webcast, run to their browser, <laughs> type in x.ai, and sign up for a trial. Sure, I am so biased that you shouldn't listen to anything I say, but here's my pitch. There's been plenty of talk about AI in the media, and we've all been exposed to it in some way, shape, or form. I'm not so sure that we've all kind of really had kind of tangible trials on AI. This is that one tool where you can actually sign up and start to schedule meetings tomorrow and have a real kind of idea of, so what is this AI thing all about? And there'll be plenty of things in the future, but if you want to kind of get a head start, I would suggest you kind of try this out. Buy us over. Dennis, it's been great. And uh, let's make sure it's not three years the next time we talk. <laughs> That's a deal. We'll do this uh, next year. We'll kind of cut it down from 36 <laughs> months to 12 months. There you go.